Good morning, everyone. Good. I was worried that you'd spent uh, last night uh, partying too, too late. Uh, we have a treat for you today. Uh, I am Vijay Kumar, I'm the session chair, and uh, it is my privilege uh, to introduce to you Professor Antonio Bicchi, uh, who will be giving the uh, plenary talk. Uh, professor Bicchi is a professor of robotics at the University of Pisa, where he heads up the robotics group at the research center E. Paggio, Piaggio at the University of Pisa, since, and he's been there since 1990. He was the director from 2003 to 2012, and he teaches robotics and control systems in the Department of Information Engineering there. He's also the senior scientist at the Italian Institute of Technology in Genoa, where he heads the Soft Robotics Lab for Human Cooperation and Rehabilitation. He's also an adjunct professor at the School of Biological and Health Sciences and Engineering uh, of, in Arizona State University. Um, Antonio graduated from the University of Bologna in 1988. He was a postdoc scholar at MIT. Uh, it, it was called the AI Lab back then in 19, from 1988 to 1990. Um, I think all of you know uh, Professor Beakey by reputation. He's a world-renowned scientist and engineer in the field of uh, robotics design and control, but specifically focusing on control uh, and haptics uh, and, and grasping. Um, we all know his papers. He's been prolific over the years, um, and uh, his work has been extensively cited. But I'll just mention a few things that maybe uh, you might not know. Uh, first, uh, he was the mover and shaker behind the establishment of the robotics and automation letters, which I believe is now one of the, uh, maybe not, maybe the highest impact factor. I, I might not have my stats right, but it was his tireless work that led to the formation of this journal that um, I think has the highest immediacy factor, I would say. Uh, that was in 2015. He also uh, founded and launched the first World Haptics Congre Conference in 2005. Um, and he, he founded the Italian Institute of Robotics uh, and, and Intelligent Machines uh, in 2019. Um, obviously, Antonio has also won, won many awards and honors, uh, best paper awards and recognitions uh, from the European Research Council and IEEE. But I'll just mention a couple of things. He's a fellow of the IEEE, of course, and he received the IEEE Ceridis uh, Leadership Award. Um, one last thing I'll just say that, you know, we've, of course, this is the first uh, conference uh, since uh, 2019 after COVID. Um, during COVID, when many of us were hunkering down, he was extremely active. Uh, he led a citizen science effort in the area of robotics to uh, come up with ways in which the robotics community could respond to COVID-19. This was in March 2020 uh, through May 2020. And one of the cool things that he did was uh, develop this uh, very low cost open source uh, robot platforms that, al that would allow family members to see patients in the hospitals uh, in, in Italy. Uh, it was called LH LHF Connect. And so long before everybody else jumped on the bandwagon, uh, Antonio was leading this revolution. So again, really proud and, and, and privileged to introduce Antonio to you, and, uh, and, and you're, you're in for a treat today. So thank you all for coming, and Antonio, please, join, please take the podium. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Vijay, for, uh, for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here, uh, being back with uh, all of you. Many of you are new here, but uh, for those who have been around for a few years now, it's really, uh, you know, really a treat. I mean, I, 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 I can't be happier than this. Mm, so today I, I, I'm going to speak about the embodied intelligence uh, aporia, and uh, but first of all, let me dedicate this talk to uh, Jean-Paul Lomont and those who illuminate us. Let me start with uh, the question of uh, where is intelligence? So there are theories about intelligence. One is that the intelligence is basically within your scope, whatever is within your scope. And if you reason like this, then you can come up with machines that do wonderful things in terms of uh, even beating humans in the most complex games. 
And then you'll regard artificial intelligence as information processing. But if you ask yourself, where is intelligence, then you can, you can play this game. You, you can assume that you have a good computational model of uh, elementary neuron, elementary unit of computation. And you have unbounded resources to build the model of the brain. Then you start replicating and expanding until you have intelligence. So the question is, where do you stop? Then you put more and more neurons, boundless number, and you cover probably the cortex. Then, of course, you still have, you have a huge program, but you have no resource limitations. Then, of course, there is the question that the brain is not just the cortex. There are the inner parts, there are the emotions, there are the motor reflexes, there are plenty of things. And everything is, has no sense unless you provide afference to move around and afference to feel what is going on. Then those afferences and afferences come from the nervous system. And if you go down the, the, the leaves, the branches, you get down until uh, the terminations, the nervous terminations, for instance, in the skin. So recently, uh, the Nobel Prize went to David Julius and Adrian Papaputian, who showed how the very tiniest molecule mechanisms already do a form of computation. At the very end of our nerve endings in the skin. So if, you, if your plan is to replicate intelligence, you cannot stop before the boundary of our body. And that is what we mean when we say in, intelligence is the body, the whole body. So that theory of embodied mind, of course, has uh, you know, is a long history. It's not new here. Um, the idea is that uh, the mind and the body make a unique uh, uh, inter uh, unity. So our vision in, in, in the program of research that we have is that uh, we want to go beyond human-robot cooperation to really have human-robot integration. Um, I would like to have a symbiosis of machines and humans so that we have better than either alone. So we, we, our goal is to have intelligence and natural machines that complement humans with processes, with wearables for rehabilitation, augmentation, with avatars. So these are the things that we will see today. And of course, to do this, we need not only technology, we need also human sciences, we need life sciences and physical sciences. And that's the beauty of our field. That's the beauty of robotics, what I think is really the uh, intellectual challenge that we have every day and that make us enjoy this job so much. So this is the idea of uh, uh, our lab, of many other labs, and uh, these pictures, you know, uh, almost you know, many, many of us have this picture in mind. You have the humans, you study the psychology, the neuroscience, the human motor control, you take uh, uh, ideas and then you do your robots, and then your robots go back to humans, uh, both for doing better science and for helping. But if you have this picture, and th this is something that I have had always in mind, then uh, there is a question here. Uh, so because we believe that intelligence is in the body, when you compare the body of the human and the body of the robot, you have flesh and blood here, you have silicon and, and steel there. How can you really learn something of, about intelligence in, in one domain that applies to the other. Uh, this is what I, I, I call the AI paradox. And of course, uh, I would like to boast, a colleague of mine, the University of Pisa, <laughs> uh, had that already. He said, uh, you know, the universe is a book that is written in mathematical terms. And only if you understand the mathematics and you abstract the information that you have to a level where then you can apply to the different domain. 
and then you apply this new theory to achieve the technology the society needs and build a science of embodied intelligence, a science of robotics. So that's, that's what we like to do. Let me get to, to Hans, and again with a philosopher that I'm very much uh, uh, indebted with, is Anaxagoras, who thought that the human, uh, humans are the most intelligent animals because they have hands. Right? And the intrinsic link of hands with intelligence is what drove most of my research in the past years. So you all know that uh, uh, this experiment, uh, this picture refers to the famous experiment of the open AI manipulation of a cubic group with a hand. But it, perhaps uh, not all of you know that uh, open AI shut down the robotics department in 2021 with Zarembra saying that, uh, you know, getting data out of robots is too hard. And, uh, you know, it's much better to, to get uh, images or, or sound. It's, that's not user, and we, we progress much more. And this is true. I mean, manipulation is one thing, but if you look at manipulation, this is not even the most difficult thing you can, this, this is by, by far not the most difficult manipulation you have. Think, for instance, of just getting a book out of a shelf. So you see, uh, when you take this book out of the shelf, you do not really have a, a grasping possible. You have to work with the book and with the environment to take it out. And your hand is shaping in ways that are dictated by the interaction with the environment. It's not completely intentional. It's not completely deterministic. It's driven by the environment. So this theory uh, uh, of extended mind generalizes the embodied mind and says that intelligence is really born even farther than the body itself, but in connection with the environment. And it is the envir body-environment connection that makes intelligence. So how can a robot reason about taking a book out of a shelf, for instance, and do it? <clears throat> in this sense, I think robotics, the, robot the program of robotics is not information processing, it's interaction processing. Coming to artificial hands, we can build hands and we can try to control. We shouldn't ever forget that there are 30,000 fibers, nerve fibers, that go to the hand, efferent, towards the hand. And there are 300,000, roughly, fibers that are afferent to the central nervous system from the hand. Those are huge numbers and a huge complexity that poses a question, how can we manage this? One way of, putting, of looking at it and formalizing to an abstract level where you can reason and then possibly go back is the idea of synergies. So synergies are, ex uh, are concepts that have been proposed in neuroscience to uh, show that the or to, to propose that the central nervous system controls movements in a synergistic manner, and this goes uh, since the early last century, are collections of relatively independent units, degrees of freedom, that behave as a single functional unit. So <clears throat> this idea of synergies, which is uh, uh, shown in this architecture, is that basically you have these funnels that organize the complexity at the low level and abstract it to a level of more symbolic, uh, if you want, treatment above. The sense of touch is an example of this enormous complexity. Uh, it's enormously complex and enormously important. Uh, you see this person here in this video by Roland Johansson, this person has been anesthetized on the fingertips. And even a simple task like striking a match becomes almost impossible. How do you work on this? Uh, the number of, uh, the number of uh, uh, receptors and the complexity is huge. So in this sense, there are synergies that uh, organize this complexity. The perception itself can be regarded as a process for 
reduction of abundant dimensions and uh, the, the complexity. So we, we look at synergies as stabilizing neural mechanism that stabilize percepts to higher order variables from varying contribution from lower le level degrees of freedom. So synergies, ACA, also known as invariants, are projections of this sensing abundance on a lower dimension. So every time you make a projection, you have ambiguity. Therefore, you, have, you, you can have illusions. And uh, you see here uh, th this effect. So a typical example is uh, optic flow. Optic flow is uh, a way of projecting, of reducing the complexity that generates illusions. And you have the classical barber pole illusion here. It's a concept that has been studied since the 50s in the, in the past year, and today is you know, ubiquitous in robotics. We have uh, David here in, first, in the first row, and he knows that very well, right? Uh, mechanoreceptors are many, of many different types in the, in the skin. Uh, Merkel cells are those who are most related to the fine definition of touch. And they are sensitive to one quantity, which is the strain energy density, which is basically how much strain is there in a, in a given place. So if you uh, want to model this phenomenon of touch, you look at uh, every part of the, of, the, of the fingertip and consider the ISO strain energy density surfaces. The parts, the surfaces in the, in the, in the fingertip surf, uh, part that have the, stay, the same density of, the form, of, uh, of energy, mechanical energy deformation. So look at this and imagine that this ISO SED is uh, an ellipse. You press more, you get a larger ellipse. And you press more, you get another one. Now you do, uh, you reason about where did, in this dynamic motion, where did uh, some level of uh, SED go. So you can uh, uh, imagine that you are looking for the same SED in another place near there, and uh, maybe it moved from here to there. You compute the, the derivative, you set it to zero, and then you come up with a flow. And that defines the flow of touch or sense uh, SED. Of course, the flow is not defined in all its components because you cannot know which component is in the, you have, a, you have an equation, you have more unknowns than equations, you have a homogeneous part and a particular solution. And the brain only goes for the particular solution because we have no clue about the homogeneous. We have no clue about uh, uh, what else. So we take typically, because of the a priori we have, we take typically the simpler, so the perpendicular part. And we ignore the homogeneous part there. That causes the illusions. Uh, tactile flow has been proposed several years ago, and uh, it grows, it shows that it can grow uh, like uh, time to contact. If you press the fingertip over the object, then the contact area grows. And if you take the integral of the divergence of the flow, then you can, uh, then you can compute how fast the contact area will grow. And this area will grow faster, you can predict from the model, the softer the object you are touching, the faster the, surf, the, the contact area will grow, as you can imagine easily. It's uh, analogous to time to contact for those who, of you who do vision. And then we have discovered that this indeed applies in humans. So we have created illusions showing that humans are exactly sensitive to this. And also, the other illusion, the barber pole, can be recreated in tactile. Now, these are work that uh, we did uh, years ago with Matteo Bianchi, but more recently we started working with, uh, again, with this idea, with a sensor that comes from Bristol. Um, Nathan Lepora is uh, collaborating with us. It's a biomimetic uh, tactile sensor that has uh, uh, 
papillae that sort of amplify a contact lens for touch. So you can measure the uh, effect of touch. And then we started doing experiments, pressing up against uh, silicon specimens of different compliance and looking at the deformation and trying to measure the, the tactile flow. And if you do this, uh, you actually see that uh, you can easily compute the tactile flow inside these, uh, these sensors, and uh, you find that uh, different specimens of different compliance, you can easily see them from the tactile flow, the contact area spread rate, distinguished. So just by touching, you know what the compliance is without <coughs> probing. Applications of this and other sensors and other technologies we have made to artificial hands, to telerobotics, to prosthesis, to medical surgery. So let me go ahead now and start talking <coughs> about the human hand and artificial hands. Human hand is a marvel, not just because of the sensory part, but also because of the motor part. A human hand has 19 degrees of freedom but that's an undercount because we also have the palm that flexes and we have other smaller articulations, so it's you know, probably 23, uh, a better count. Again, synergies organize this motion of the hand. And it turns out that uh, there are synergies that uh, are uh, fun functional units of the working of the hand that have been recognized in several different domains. One is the kinematic, just looking at how the hand moves and making the correlation, the most frequent ways of using hands. The muscular level, what activations we have. The cortical level, what parts of the brain we use in different times. And even the motor neuron, the spiking neuron correlations uh, all, all in, the, in, the, in the spine. Um, so it's important that we started uh, looking at these uh, synergies and uh, even at the, at the basic uh, level to find correlations between, for instance, the image that you have in the cortex and the actual motion of the hand. Or more recent work we are doing with uh, Dario Farina between the motor neurons in the spine and the actions of the hand. So these things tell you how to organize the hand and then you can start thinking of building one. If you look at how the hand grasps, and I'm coming back to the point of the environment, how the human grasps an object. Again, you can fool the humans to understand and make him grasp a hologram. So you see that uh, your hand is not going to the right position. It's going inside the object. It's going inside the object because it has a template which controls the hand, which is one of those synergies and counts or relies on the adaptability of the hand itself to establish the forces that we need. So humans, hand, humans control the hand through interaction with the environment. And uh, interaction elicits the contact forces which, uh, the actu that, that actuate the remaining degrees of freedom of the hand. So the hand is actuated, the 19 degrees of freedom are actuated by the interaction with the environment. We use the environment to move our hands. And uh, robots must learn to plan grasp purposefully, exploiting environmental interaction. We have been working on artificial hands since uh, uh, many years, but in ten, the last 10 years or so, we started working with these ideas of the synergies and soft robotics to build a family of soft hands. And, uh, uh, with uh, Manuel Catalano and Giorgio Grioli, who are my main uh, collaborators and colleagues, we have started uh, building hands that only use one motor, have 19 degrees of freedom, but only use one motor to actuate the first synergy, and then work with the environment to control the other 18, if you want. Uh, this hand has been licensed to the uh, uh, industry, it has been transformed in a prosthesis, as you will see in a minute. It's been open, uh, it has been released in the open hardware so that others could build. For instance, Inail is uh, doing a prosthesis that is now uh, almost uh, it's certified. Um, and then we uh, are also moving forward to have uh, new uh, research projects 
we are now uh, now this this uh, these weeks uh, uh, 36 patients in the states are using our hand for two months at home to compare with the other existing hands and uh, and we are also working now on implementing those tactile sensing principles that i mentioned before inside the socket as you can see here This is the version one of the hand that we did uh, a few years ago. And you can appreciate how the whole number of degrees of freedom are used by the hand, although we are only using one model. But every degree of freedom is actuated by the environment, by the interaction with the environment. So there are a few uh, things you can do. Of course, there, it takes some creativity to work with the environment. And this demo is programmed. But you can also think of reasoning about how to do that. Reasoning about how to elicit the movements that you want from the hand. And you exploit compliance of the hand to do things that other hands maybe would not be able to do. And here is the book. With this hand, you can take the book off. And indeed, here we have, uh, this experiment is teleoperated. But we do have, uh, with George Polail, we have uh, a method for doing this autonomously. So, and, and that has been demonstrated, not in this video. So you take it out, and then you grasp the book and move on. OK, the new thing is that we have a hand that now has two synergies. Why only one? One is good, but cannot do inner manipulation. So you have now two synergies, the first and the second synergies. So you have infinity to the second uh, possible grasps. And you can do things, oh, this is not, yeah. Uh, you can do things like uh, manipulating uh, in, within your hand, adapting to the shape of the object. And if you go to the exhibition now, this has become a, a new product of the spin-off uh, that, uh, that, uh, that you can see. It's just a second motor. You see the, the dorso here is a little bit uh, thicker. And again, uh, you can imagine how many uh, things you can program, you, you can imagine. And, uh, and, and do. The, of, course, of course, the main one of the most motivating applications is prosthetics. In prosthetics, you have to use uh, other inputs. There's not programs. For instance, the EMG to take uh, inputs from the, uh, the subject. And you see here, this is the soft end 2 controller with, two, with, uh, with EMGs by this person. It's just mimicking right, what the person is doing with its hand with the, with the other hand. In a new project that we started a couple of years ago with Dario Farina and, and uh, Sargent in Vienna, Professor Asman, we are now developing a natural bionic interface between, directly between the spine and the prosthesis. So uh, the surgeon is making a surgical uh, Professor Asman is making a surgical uh, targeted muscle array innervation that already reacts not only the efferent but also the afferent nerves to a part of the, uh, uh, of the amputated arm. And Professor Farina is uh, taking with micro high density electrodes all the neural, sense, uh, neural uh, signals that uh, you have here and, send and bring that back step them to uh, understand what their motor neurons are uh, telling in the spine. So what is the role of robotics here? The role of robotics is to close the loop between these input-output ports that we have here and send this efferent to the hand and get the afferent back. And the key here is that we have to do that in, in, a, in a sensible way. An important, I mean, to me, very inspirational paper is this paper by 
uh, Roland Johansson and, uh, and Benoni Eddin, who stated that humans do not use feedback in real time so often. For a manipulation task, for instance, the time that it gets for an information to come back from the contact to the central nervous system is tens of milliseconds. It's less, it's far too slow for allowing us to do the real-time interaction. So what really happens, according to their theory, is that we have plants, motor plants, that contain also the expected reaction from the sensory system. So our plan is made of an efferent and afferent plan that go to the hand, and we simply check that the plan has gone to, we use the afferents just to check that the plan has gone uh, uh, according to plans. So if that is true, to have a, a, a hand that feels natural, we have to match that expectation. Therefore, we have to have uh, motor plans that contain a sensory expectation, and the processes should bring back a physical interaction that is consistent. We call this uh, consistent artificial sensory motor contingencies. And we have to build a hand that physically interacts with the environment so as to elicit uh, reactions, sensory feedbacks, that are consistent with the action that you have. So for instance, the hand has to be compliant, has to be soft, because our hand is soft and compliant. Um, but, oops, sorry. Yeah. with this uh, prosthetic hand in challenge all these difficult tasks. Being in this competition for me means really being in a great team, in a special team. I really feel the support of all the members. Being there in real life. So this is the uh, part of uh, the work. Uh, this is the Cybathlon. We participated to this uh, very nice uh, initiative of ETH and Robert Riner. Uh, we came up second. That was good. Um, let's move uh, to, to the next part, which is human-robot integration. So we have been speaking about uh, <clears throat> prosthesis. Uh, now we want to take this to another level. We want to make robots that are useful and usable for people, real people. Uh, I would say robot extensions. Of course, a prosthesis can be, you know, can go farther than just the hand, can be the whole hand, or you can think of a machine that works with you, like an exoskeleton. But if you have an exoskeleton, um, why do you want to be there? If the exoskeleton is powerful enough, you can also let it go. And you know, it don't need to be physically where the exoskeleton is. And therefore, basically, you're back to teleoperation. Right? Teleoperation has been there. I, teleoperation is becoming popular again. I think it's, you know, the, the, the reason is that it, it's really effective. It's really effective. It's, it's been around, it's the, first, the very first robots have been teleoperated. The most commercially successful robots are teleoperated, like the Da Vinci or all the drones that the people use. So, what is teleoperation? Teleoperation is uh, substituting the interaction that the body has with the environment with a device, a technical device that is then transmitted forward. What are the issues with teleoperation? Of course, everybody knows that there is a transparency, trans stability trade-off, because you have delays in communication. We know that very well, and we know to some extent what we can do. We know that more than that we cannot do. But another thing is not always uh, very clear, is that another problem in teleoperation is the inconsistent sensory motor uh, synergies or consistencies that we get out of the hardware. So we insist on this fact, and we insist on the fact that if you look at what the operator, common, what motor common sense to the avatar, and what it gets back, it also has to obey to this law of sensory motor contingencies being consistent. So the avatar, in our view, has to have physical uh, correspondences with what we expect to have. 
we, it has to interact with the environment in a, in, in a natural way. So with this uh, idea, we started doing avatars much earlier than, uh, than, uh, than the recent uh, interest that uh, luckily is, uh, is coming. We, we sent a, a robot avatar at the Armatrice earthquake in 2016, uh, where uh, we could uh, explore safely from outside one of those uh, uh, damaged houses. You see here pictures of the robot getting inside the house, uh, taking accurate measurements of cracks, uh, taking a slam view of the, and reporting to the architect so that it could safely evaluate the stability of, of the building. Uh, moving on from there, we have started doing things with uh, uh, systems that are more uh, usable, lightweight. So for instance, here you have two arms that manipulate. Uh, an arm. You see, we are not using exoskeletons for the operator. We make it as light as possible. Um, the operator controls the system by sending positions and sending impedance controls. The same impedance that the human has in his arm is replicated, we call it tele-impedance, is replicated in the robot so that you have a natural mechanical interaction. And of course, you have hands. So at some point, as you see here, you might need to use the, the two hands separately. In some points, instead, the motion of your hand, the operator's hand, is mapped to the object so that you move the object around and the robots just comply. So it's not trivial teleoperation. It's, you know, there is some autonomy there. And of course, you can do nice things with these uh, simple devices. And we've developed a, a, a little alter ego robot that is uh, uh, shown here. It's a, a little humanoid on wheels that can move autonomously among people with some simple behaviors. Uh, the robot is compliant actually is variable compliance. It's a pretty cute uh, robot. Uh, and uh, it is autonomous, but it accepts human inhabitants. It has soft robotic muscles, variable stiffness. It has soft hands. It has tactile, visual, audio, and even emotional feedback. And we use tele-impedance control to match the sensory contingencies. So you can autonomously, partly autonomously, or teleoperating, dance with the robot who comes around with you. Is not able to lead the dance, not yet. I mean, if you want to lead the dance, you have to be teleoperating. If you, if you want to follow the dance, then it, do it, it does it autonomously. Of course, you can use it uh, when you are away from home. That, that is the reason why we, we did it. Away from home, you can do things like uh, uh, attending the pets, opening to the postman, uh, bringing food or medicines to a person that is uh, there. The robot has this uh, soft behavior that allows it to interact with people in a very natural and also emotional way. You can feel who is operating the robot from the robot, from the physical contact with the robot. You can, at least this is the goal. You can tell who is behind it, if you know the person. You can also think of uh, using these sensory motor contingencies in a, in a different way. So we, we have these motor plans together with their measurement, together with their expected reactions. So if we record this flow of what has happened, what action did I take when I saw or measured something, I can then replicate it. So I don't even call this learning because this is much simpler than learning. So what we are doing here is we put an object, the operator grasps the object and does something. Then when the robot sees that the object again, it simply goes for the same flow of sensory motor contingencies. So it's going to grasp it and then it looks for the other action 
that is suggested by an environment and finds the, 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 the green hook and puts the same object in the same hook. Then if you have more objects that you don't know, then the operator gets back in the scene and shows what to do with a glue can or with the connector. And that's it, of course. At this point, you don't need to be uh, teleoperating again because the robot knows that that flow of sensory motor contingencies has, you know, he has to follow. And they will just go through it again. It's a very simple program that is done without ever coding any uh, line of code. Uh, and of course, once you have this program, you can run it, play it again as many times as you want, or even fast forward and physically do it twice the velocity. We have implementations of this uh, system that are also industrial. We are working with uh, a number of industries in, in the joint lab that we have in Bergamo. And for instance, this is an interesting application where we are um, uh, repairing a board in a dark factory in Milan using parts that are uh, some hundred kilometers away in Bergamo, controlling everything from Genova. So basically the, me the, the, the mechanism here is that when something happens in one of those dark factories, in that data center, an order comes and a board is prepared in, 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 a, in a warehouse sent to the, to the plant, a person is sent to the plant because the plant has, is not attended normally, and they do the work. So the idea here is that you have two robots, and you have operators that, instead of traveling all these miles, stay there and simply do things from remote. And this was working. Uh, as you can see, uh, we, we don't go through everything, but the robot gets in, goes to the cabinet, changes the board, and does all the operations that are needed while the other robot is taking the board out of the box and putting it into the uh, Another nice thing that you can do is, uh, is jumping. So the person here is uh, now controlling the avatar, or the alter ego avatar, and then at some point you can jump and become another robot. While possibly the first one is keeping doing something that he has learned. And now you are this other robot. And you move around in the, sh in the plant. And, and then, again, you can jump and become another robot. And so on and so forth. And uh, OK. So let me close with a, a final uh, nice uh, uh, recent experience that we had. This is the Ocean 1K Corsica expedition that we did in February 2002. This is a huge, uh, uh, wonderful project that Stanford uh, has with uh, DRASM, which is the uh, uh, sub, um, underwater archaeology department in, uh, in France, of the Ministry of Culture in France. And their plan was to go to uh, explore some environments under the sea. 1K stands for 1,000 meters behind, uh, be below. And uh, we participated uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this endeavor led by Osama Khatib uh, with, uh, with our hands that you see there. So these are the archaeologists. And on the back, you see the scene of a Roman wreck uh, of first century after Christ. And these are the engineers. You recognize some of them, probably, uh, at least one. <laughs> uh, and here is Manuel Catalano, Manuel Barbarossa, and uh, Domenico Mura, our crew. Uh, the robot is teleoperated, is underwater, goes to first mission was to go to a, a ra to the plane that crashed in 1940 some. I don't remember exactly. And here we have a video. Oh, okay, we found it. Ah, bah, c'est génial. Nous avons le, le robot est à voisinage immédiat de l'épave là, on l'a devant nous. Le soir, qui
more down, more down, stop, okay, forward, 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 down to the right, back forward. Slowly, we are almost there. In the back, back, I, I have to come from the back to the rest. Okay, I touch it, I feel it. Yeah, I, I, I mean with the back of the hand. You, you can feel it, put your hand, you can feel it. You, you feel it. That. Oh, wait. On l'a touché. And uh, that was great, great experience. Then we went uh, a little bit farther down in an area, uh, 350 meters, I think, down uh, under the surface. A beautiful scene of uh, antique amphoras. Uh, here is the robot trying to get one of those lucerne out of, the, out of there. Those are, are, are there since ever. And you, know, you really need to get them out. Uh, forcefully, but also trying to be delicate, not to crush them. So here is one that we got, and then, and then the robot goes and moves towards another robot where it has to put the, the, the Lucerna, and uh, you have this rendezvous underwater. I, that was not, we were in charge of the hands. The rest was Stanford and Drassen. But I, I, I always underestimated how difficult it is to do rendezvous underwater. Everybody is thinking of a rendezvous in the space. Uh, underwater is ten times more harder. Um, uh, Osama went on and went down to almost 1,000 meters with a cruiser, the crispy cruiser here. I just want to say that uh, working with Osama, I mean, I, I've known Osama since ever, but working with him is something that. You know, I, I, I wish you have a chance because it's, it's like, you know, one day we had a thruster burned and Osama, uh, the days I started at four in the morning and typically ended at midnight. And Osama was working the whole day on the Jacobians and, and, and with the students, take that line out and it was writing the code until he fixed it. So that, that, I mean, I must tell, the stamina, it's not just the genius, it's the stamina. So this is uh, uh, some of the students that we had. Many of them now are professors. We are still very close. I'm, you know, I feel so uh, fortunate to have had such collaborators. Some of them I mentioned, some of them I couldn't. Uh, thank you very much for, for being with me so far. And I'll close with this little video that Edil did recently. Thank you very much. Such an amazing talk. Some of you may be old enough to remember this AT&T commercial, reach out and touch someone. That, that's what was playing in my head <laughs> during your talk. Um, it's time for questions. There are two microphones, one on this side and one on this side. And we also have uh, perhaps a mobile microphone. Um, and I'm also monitoring the chat for questions. Uh, please. Uh, hi. My name is Prashant Suresh. I'm from University of Georgia Think Lab. And uh, that was a riveting talk, to say the least. So uh, I was really uh, you know, fascinated by that philosopher that you referred to who said, uh, uh, we are intelligent because of our hands. And uh, you also talked about uh, human robot like uh, blending together instead of like going one step beyond the interaction. And uh, you also mentioned that we are much of our intelligent in, intelligence comes from like the way we interact with the environment around us and it's not just our brain but our body uh, so here my question is 
uh, like once we start getting these robotic prostheses and like or teleoperating and not actually touching the world around us physically through our body, uh, how do you think that will affect our learning and intelligence in the future uh, for the upcoming generations? That's one. And my second question is, this might sound a little cliche, but uh, what's your take on consciousness and how do you think this will affect that? Okay. Uh, first one, I think they're not that far. <laughs> the two questions are similar in a sense because I, I, I really think that um, that's where we are going. I, I, I see that robots are going to be... Uh, it's easy to imagine these type of robots to become personal. Uh, I don't think we are dreamers if we think that uh, sooner or later we will have a robot at home. Why not? I mean, we are used now to do to work uh, away from 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 home or the other way around. We will have that, and we will get used to it, as we have got used to Zoom and the and the others. Um, there will be many, and we will have that experience more and more, uh, especially because you don't need to program, you don't need to need the C plus plus to use the robot with these interfaces. Uh, after a little while that you are a robot, that you become a robot, that you are you know, living the, the life of the robot through the robot, then the experience, uh, the interesting experience is that you start looking at things in a different way. And for instance, I even had a video here that I didn't show. Uh, if you take a ride, you go around, you interact with the environment, uh, you get into a room, you see someone, and they, they normally stare at you at the beginning. You, uh, you know, you, you, you impersonate the robot, and then you come back, and, and it happened to me, and you know, and you see yourself from outside, and it, you know, it's like an experience. They say, oh, "Yeah, who is who am I?" Uh, I, I think there is a lot uh, in being a bot that is unknown, and consciousness. The most famous paper in consciousness is probably what is it like to be a bat. I think now we can rephrase it: what is it like to be a bot? Uh, so a quick follow-up. Okay, there are people lining up on both sides, so let me just go on to the left side. Is, is there somebody there? Okay, yes. hello, uh, Tom Verstraten, yeah. University of Brussels. Um, in many of the examples that you were showing uh, with the soft hands, I noticed that uh, during the manipulation tasks, uh, you rely on friction uh, to get it done. I also noticed that on the surface of the soft hands, there appears to be a high friction material. Now. As I'm standing here, my palms are a little bit sweaty, and I know that my friction coefficient is decreasing uh, right now. So my question is, within the paradigm of embodied intelligence, how important is it for the mechanical parameters to be constant, and how do you deal with variations in those uh, parameters? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, to really do this program of having the, uh, the, the sensory motor contingency to get them right, we should go to the very tiny details. For instance, our skin changes their friction coefficient depending on the humidity that we have. And if you climb, you know very well that you get uh, your, your hand in, 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 the, in, the, in the powder to get more friction again. Um, it's possible, it's conceivable that we will have robots that can change, that have material, intelligent materials that can change those properties to match <coughs> the environment. It's not tomorrow. But it is important that the materials and the physics of the robot match as close as possible those that you would expect. I must say that we have an incredible capability of uh, uh, adapting. Uh, you know, we have an enormous plasticity now in, in, in our brain. So we can adapt and learn to do things that are not exactly how we expect. We are flexible, we are intelligent. But nonetheless, there are things that are hardwired in our uh, sensory motor system. And therefore, we have to find w a right compromise between uh, what we can do and what we cannot do yet. I don't know if I got your question right, but I, uh, I hope so. No, I think you did. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hello, Professor. Thank you so much for the amazing talk. Uh, I'm Sarmat Mehrdad. I'm from Merit Lab at New York University. And uh, my research 
revolves around surgical robotics and medical robotics, so I know the importance of haptics. But after your talk, I realized that maybe I don't know so many of the environments that a robot can interact with and what would be the challenges there. In your experience, I wanted to ask, what is the most challenging environment for a robot to interact with and uh, be able to give feedback and have sick feedback? Um, well, underwater is pretty challenging, I must say. <laughs> uh, um, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 it's not easy to say what is the most challenging environment. I think the most interesting environment to me is every day's environment, activities of daily life, uh, in the house, in the garden, in, in the places where normal people live. That, that is really what I want to do, to have robots that can you know, live with you in the normal environment without changing the environment. I, I would say that that is the challenge to us. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about, I guess you, you've advocated for this pretty low level of detail in, in sort of the human and, and robot modeling and, and really trying to match many of those, those capabilities and, and sensors and things like that. Um, but I, I've also observed a huge amount of heterogeneity in terms of you know, human capabilities and sensing and you know, talking about building prostheses when people might have you know, amputations at different levels. Um, I'm curious how you think about sort of parsing out the relevant pieces of that heterogeneity and musculoskeletal, cognitive, you know, speak to this however you'd, you'd like, but, um, you know, how can we build these devices that are, that are useful to, to wider populations? Um. Um, again, I'm not sure I get the, exactly the points. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you my uh, uh, honest answer. To build things that are affordable, that's the point. Um, I think we need to, uh, we have to go simple. Uh, that means, for instance, uh, using fewer actuators in a system. That's the idea of the hand. Using fewer actuators means that uh, you have uh, less hardware, but also you have less effort in programming. Fewer, fewer lines of code, perhaps. Easier to control for a person that has a prosthesis, for instance, because you can only count on one, maximum two inputs from, from, the, from the stump. Uh, that is part of it. So simplicity is, is a big part of the answer. Simple is not easy. Simple means, I mean, it's easier to build something very complex that has everything together. But to do something that is simple and does the same is much harder. So I think there is a lot of research that it, uh, uh, is required to go simpler. That's my best wisdom on this. Great. Thank you. We have, we have time for one last short question. Hi. Gabriel Bondano for Warnercraft. So I don't know whether it is short, but uh, I really love the concept of embodied intelligence and the robot operating, well, determining emotion directly through interaction with the environment. So most of your case studies and demonstration were about manipulation and grasping. I'm wondering whether you have studies or at least thoughts about applications to leg locomotion. Um, yes. Uh, um. Manuel Catalano, my colleague, has a, a, a project on, on uh, soft feet, for instance, where the same ideas apply to um, locomotion. Um, and uh, it shows that uh, you can adapt to different terrains, especially little asperities that uh, tend to make unstable uh, the, 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 the locomotion for uh, a flat-footed robot very much, uh, much more, you know, absorb it uh, in, in a much nicer way. That's one point. Uh, of course, mobility is also a matter of uh, sensory motor contingencies to me. And uh, another thing that we are doing that is related is that you can teach a sensory motor program to a robot by just even if the robot is moving around, then you, you know, just record the flow, and then the robot will execute it again, the very, much, very much the same way. I didn't show it here, but it's this, the same thing.
that you can do. So you, you just show it once, and then it will replicate it, in, even in different conditions, but it will just go through those uh, uh, breadcrumbs that you disseminate in terms of sensory motor contingencies and just follow those breadcrumbs. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you very much. Let's give Antonio another round of applause. Thank you.